Hello everyone, welcome to Computer Science E76. My name is Dan Armendaris and today we are starting to dive into the native development for Android. Whereas last week we said that, you know, it was part of the Android portion and it certainly is, but we really had to do sort of a primer for stuff. Today we're really going to get a chance to dive in and start talking about some of the really interesting aspects uh, that are specific to Android. And for us to be able to do that, I, was, I must once again refer you to a website that's going to become very near and dear to your heart and to your keyboard, I must say, uh, in the upcoming weeks, and that is the, uh, the Android developer site at developer.android.com. From there, you can find a lot of very useful things, including how uh, some instructions to help you get set up with Eclipse and the ADT plugin and the SDK itself. Uh, some tutorials if you want to get started with some pretty basic examples and some not so basic examples. There's also uh, there's a lot of really good documentation there available as well about a lot of the packages that are included with Android and we will start to use a lot of this documentation ourselves in the upcoming weeks. And so of course when we're talking about Android we're talking about a, uh, a platform that has been developed at first for cell phones and, uh, and now has sort of spread to tablets as well. And in fact there, recently, Google has announced uh, a version 3.0 of like a preview version of its latest Android software, which is uh, codenamed Honeycomb, and that is designed primarily, they've said, for the tablets. And there's a lot of really neat UI features and a lot of departures from their current uh, sort of language that they use in 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 their uh, in their current Android phones. But hopefully, we will start to see some of those things trickle down to some of the smartphones as well over time. So we did say also that Android is actually built on top of an open source Linux platform. It is entirely possible for you to look at uh, the source code of a great many things uh, related to Android, even compile some of it yourself if you felt so inclined to do so. Um, but this does actually give us some really relatively interesting tools. As you will see a little bit later today, we can actually connect to a, an actual physical phone and perform some commands, issue some commands to that phone uh, over basically what is essentially a, um, it's not like an, it's not an SSH connection, but it looks as though we have a shell access to that phone. Uh, of course, there are two different development kits that are available from Google. One is the software development kit, the SDK, and that's what we're going to be working with. I will iterate, or I will repeat again, that there is also the native development kit, the NDK, that's available, and we are frankly not even going to get anywhere near that in this class. If that's something that interests you, I recommend getting uh, relatively comfortable with the SDK first before diving into that uh, native development kit, just because it is development in an entirely different language, usually something like C or C++, and that allows you to write some much lower level code that would be uh, useful for things like uh, that are very CPU intensive, just as an example. And that's while we can do some CPU intensive things ourselves, we can't necessarily optimize quite as well as we can with such a lower level uh, language. <clears throat> now, uh, the SDK, as we, as you probably know from last week, it's, it's based on Java. And basically what we are going to be writing and working with is Java, but it is not really Java in the same sense that we had been talking about yesterday. In particular, what happens, uh, uh, what, or not yesterday, but last week, what happened last week was we would write some source code into a Java file, and then we went into a, uh, into a command line and, write, and, and ran that Java C uh, program so that we could compile the Java source code into Java bytecode. And then from there, we would run the program by telling the, uh, the Java virtual machine that we wanted to run this bytecode, and it would interpret and uh, run that program for us. And uh, to create a program and an application in, uh, for Android, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Yes, we are going to be writing our source code in Java, and we are going to be compiling that into Java bytecode, but that by itself is not enough to run an application in Android. There's a few more steps that have to happen in order for this to be successful. Most notably, we have to convert the Java bytecode into what is actually running on these devices, which is the Dalvik virtual machine. So we have to convert from Java bytecode to this Dalvik uh, executable, basically. And that can be done very simply with, uh, with a command called dx. And that just takes the Java bytecode and it does all the appropriate conversions for us. Now, the main differences between Dalvik virtual machine and the Java virtual machine is that the Dalvik machine is a lot, it has a lot lower memory footprint. It's a lot more efficient in terms of memory, and it also is optimized so that multiple VMs can be running at once on the same device that is meant to be a mobile device. In fact, this is a very important concept. Each application that you write, or each application that you run, rather, on an Android machine is, is contained within its own virtual machine. And 
uh, what, what's even more sort of mind-blowing is that even when you have one application running, you can have multiple virtual machines running just by extension, just by the way that uh, Android works. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. So once we have a Dalvik executable, that's not actually quite enough. The end result that we need is a .apk file. And this .apk file has a very specific uh, format to it. And it has to be zipped up and contain a, a number of other resources as well. So not only do we have to have the executable, but also do we have to include some other resources uh, that, that uh, are packaged with, uh, with the executable itself in order to form a final Android package or an APK file. So um, this is actually pretty interesting. If you have, if you download a .apk file from the internet, because it is actually possible, unlike the iOS SDK, it is actually possible to download and install applications that are just found on the internet. You can actually go to, uh, you can enable a setting in your, in your Android phone, and you can visit a website that, ha that allows you to download a .apk file and the phone will actually download and install it from that website. And it's actually very easy. You don't have to go through uh, the, uh, the marketplace, which is Android's equivalent of the App Store, if you're not too familiar. Uh, you don't have to go through the marketplace in order to install all of the applications. It's, it's actually relatively easy. And as you'll see, all you really need to install an application, not only uh, would something like that work, which is to download an APK file over the internet, uh, but you could also just connect your phone to your computer using USB and install files and install applications and also uh, get and push files to the device that way as well. And so this is actually something that makes developments just ever so slightly easier uh, in some respects uh, than iOS development, at least in my opinion. So we have all of this this stuff that we have to deal with. Oh yeah, so I remember the point. So if I can come off this tangent, where I was talking about the APK file, you can actually download this. And if you actually come across a URL where you can download an APK file, you might actually try downloading that onto your computer and uh, renaming it from .apk to .zip, because all an APK file is is just a renamed zip file, and try unzipping it and see the contents of that file itself. You will see the, uh, the executable itself, you will see some of the other resources that are included with the APK file. It's an open format and it makes it relatively easy for you to see some of these things. Of course, a number of developers like to protect their resource and the, uh, resources and they'll try to obfuscate code so the executable won't very, be very easy to, uh, to decompile, uh, um, uh, you know, so on and so forth. But it is at least, it gives you a sense of the, the structure of the APK file. So now I've been talking about how some of this makes it a little bit easier than uh, iOS to develop an application for. But looking at a, a, a chart like this actually might make it seem kind of daunting and, uh, and difficult. And that might certainly be the case if it weren't for Eclipse. So Eclipse, like we've been talking about, is, an, is actually an IDE and uh, that's independent from, uh, from Google and from Android. And it's actually an open source IDE and it has available for it a plugin that's been made, uh, that's been given by Google that allows us to interact the Android SDK with Eclipse IDE. And so it abstracts all of these, uh, all of these extra steps into something that can just be done relatively easily with just the IDE. We open up the IDE, we write our Java source code, we do some other things to make sure that everything is all set to go for our Android package, and then we can export directly and even publish um, from, uh, from our exported file to the marketplace. We can't publish directly from the IDE, but at least we are given an APK file, and that file we can then publish to the marketplace relatively easily. And so this is why we are saying that you should use the Eclipse IDE. No other IDEs are available that have at least a, a sanctioned by, by Google plugin that allows it to work with the, um, with, the, with the Android SDK tools. So as you can tell, there's a couple of different moving parts that are involved here. First, there's the IDE that's, that's called Eclipse. So generally, and again, all of these inst instructions are given not only in the setup PDF, but also on the Android developer site. But basically, what you're, the overall thing that you're going to do to get all set up is first download Eclipse, because that's completely separate from everything else. You'll download the latest version that's appropriate for your computer. Then you'll download the Android SDK. Now, what's interesting about the SDK is that even though it does actually include quite a few tools with it, it doesn't actually include the tools necessary to create and build an application for a specific operating system, uh, for a specific version of the Android operating system. So we've been talking about how you can create an APK file, 
But some of these tools are actually specific to versions of the, uh, to, of the Android OS. And those things do not actually come with the SDK. So not only do you have to download Eclipse, and not only do you have to download the SDK, and not only do you have to download the plugin that allows Eclipse to interact with the SDK, but you also have to download a fourth and final thing, which are all of the SDK components. And luckily, the SDK components are, are sort of set up last. After you've gotten all of those moving parts together and set up, you can actually run Eclipse and then open up the Android SDK from there, and you will be presented with a window that looks something like this. And from here, you can actually go ahead and install. You can see what sort of available, package the, available packages there are, what installed packages there are. And basically, I'm going to tell you right now that I recommend you install everything that's available, just because that will make it easier for you. You don't have to decide which ones you need. And it's going to make it easier for you to know and, uh, and to create applications that work on a variety of platforms. And what's nice about this is that this allows us to target our applications for specific platforms. So generally, what is, is uh, good practice is to write your application for the oldest version of the OS that you possibly can. And as you start to work with various uh, things with the API, you'll be able to look up uh, each of these things in the documentation that's available on the Android developer site, and you'll be able to see the API level that's associated with each of these API calls. So what that means is that you will be able to determine, okay, well, I know that I'm doing some relatively complex stuff that was only av made available after, say, Android release 2. And so you would be able to find then the revision or the, uh, the SDK platform that matches your specific version and make and build your application against the oldest version that is possible. Because that is going to, what is going to, uh, that is what is going to make your uh, application a success. Not everybody is running the latest version of the Android OS, even though quite a few people are, even though there are quite a few people running version 2.0 and later. In fact, many of the applications that you will see in this class, and even a lot of the source code that you'll see for this class, works starting on Android version 1.5 and later. There's a lot of backwards compatibility uh, that a lot of the APIs have. And so what's nice is that uh, APIs that, um, that work in older versions um, Google guarantees, even though I don't know how long they'll be able to maintain this guarantee, they guarantee that it will continue to work in later versions as well, which is a, sort of a nice thing for backwards compatibility of your application, uh, uh, of your application as you develop that. So uh, moving on, we could see that we have to install quite a few things and uh, get quite a few things ready to go. And once you get set up with the clips, and once you sort of power through all of these setup instructions that are made available, and frankly, I think even if, if you find the, uh, the setup instructions on the PDF that's related to the Android setup project to be a little bit cumbersome, then one of the things you can do is just try looking at uh, the setup instructions available on the developer site. And I find that those are actually pretty good, though it's also kind of complicated, just because, like I said, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things you have to download and get prepared. Um, so set aside some time to do that and do it properly. <coughs> excuse me. Now, <coughs> excuse me. I will also recommend that you run the latest versions of all of these things, including Eclipse. The latest version right now is 3.6.1. Uh, the latest version of the SDK, which you can download off the um, off the website, and all of the latest platform tools. In fact, if you sort of jumped the gun a little bit and started downloading each of these things before the class started, there was actually an update to these just a couple of weeks ago. And I think there's now a latest version. I think the platform tools in particular have been updated to reflect the new uh, the honeycomb preview that exists as well, in addition to perhaps version 2.3 of the OS. And so I certainly recommend that you go back and make sure that everything is up to date. That will minimize problems. And we are actually going to require that for the projects that you use Eclipse, because the way that you will submit projects to us is to create an Eclipse project uh, and then zip it up, basically, and submit that to us. And it's just so that we can standardize everything and do it easily, even though it is entirely possible to not use an IDE like Eclipse and just do all of this stuff manually using the, uh, the manual tools that are available through the SDK and the platform tools. Uh, we are just going to make it, it's just going to make it across the board, require that everybody use the Eclipse IDE. So okay, so there's a whole bunch of tools available to us. And it would really take us, it would be sort of um, long and boring to go over what each of them do. But there are a couple of important ones that I want to point out now. And in fact, some of them we're going to start using 
almost right away. And the first one is something called ADB. This is a program that's, that stands for the Android Debug Bridge. And it's basically a client-server pair that acts as a, as a bridge between your machine and, uh, and, the em and, and an emulated device or even a physical device. And so this will allow you to communicate with either an emulated or physical device and do some things like install applications or look at the log file or even traverse the, the directory structure of the device itself. Uh, view log files, if I didn't say that already. Uh, just a whole bunch of other stuff that's actually going to be useful. There's, you can redirect standard out and standard error. So if you're familiar at all with Linux, then you probably are familiar with standard out and standard error. Unfortunately, by default, uh, Android actually redirects standard out and standard error to dev null, which means that there's, if anything is ever output to that, you will never see it. But using ADB, you can actually re-redirect standard out and standard error to a log or to a console just so that you can see what's going on behind the scenes and give you a little bit more insight when you're debugging your applications. There's also a, uh, an app, uh, sort of a sub-application to ADB called Monkey that allows you to simulate uh, uh, presses and touches and touch events on the screen or on the emulated device uh, so that you can stress test your application. So you can actually interface with this using a scripted language and perform a number of, of predefined uh, taps so that you can very easily test each of these. We're not going to uh, get a chance to look at Monkey specifically, but it is at least something that will be useful if you are serious about creating an Android application. Now the other and perhaps the even more important uh, uh, command line application that's available to us is the Android application. And this, you've already sort of seen that it was that uh, Android uh, manager, the AVD manager, and that allows you to create uh, Android virtual devices or AVDs. This is just another name for the emulated devices that we'll see. You could also make sure that all the platform tools are up to date. You can download new platform tools. Uh, you can uh, delete. Uh, so, I mean, it's, that's basically the entirety of it. All of those are basically, or all of the other things that you can do with it are basically related to those things. Now, some of the other applications that are available to us include the emulator itself, which allows us to run the AVDs in, in a small emulated window on our screen and also um, SQLite 3. So um, this will allow us to do a, a number of data storage options. We're not going to see how to use this for a couple more lectures still, but it is actually useful for us to be able to look at a, a SQLite database that exists either on our phone or perhaps we created on our computers and then upload it to the phone or emulated device and work with it from there. So keep all of these things in mind, but also uh, recall that there are a whole bunch more commands uh, that are available that do a whole bunch of different things. So I recommend going once again to the uh, development page and taking a look at all of the things that are available to you. Some of them will make more sense to you than others just in the sense of what of your goals for an application. Some of these will actually might be pretty useful and interesting. Now, uh, it bears repeating one more time that uh, the emulator does have a certain set of limitations. And what's nice is that you can actually interface a physical device with Eclipse as well so that you can overcome a number of these limitations. Some of these limitations include things like uh, no support for um, uh, you know, receiving phone calls, though you can actually emulate that a little bit without actually uh, you know, maintaining a phone call. You can actually uh, emulate the, the, the phone ringing, essentially. Uh, you cannot uh, change, um, I mean, a lot of these make sense, frankly. We've talked about this before. A lot of these make sense because it's an emulated device. It's not a physical device, so you don't have access to physical ports, like a, like a USB port. You don't have access to an SD card slot. Uh, and so a lot of these uh, emulator limitations are sort of uh, going to be a little bit annoying depending on the type of application you are trying to create. But again, you can connect a physical device and uh, overcome some of these. What's interesting is that some of the nice things about the emulator are also some of the downfalls of the emulated device. So what you, or rather the physical device. So what you, I think you will end up finding is that it is useful to use both, to actually have an emulated device and then as you get, as you're, uh, programming gets a little bit more serious and also use a physical device to perform these these tests. Now we've talked about some of the SDK tools themselves and I mentioned before ADB. Now if you had programmed before with Android you might know that ADB is, is a tool that's available with the SDK. This is this we've already seen but I do want to mention that recently one of the more uh, recent SDK updates have made the ADB program no longer an SDK tool but now a platform tool and so some of the platform tools that are available are specific to individual platforms. Now ADB is, is one of those but some 
some of these include AAPT, which is an asset packaging tool, which allows you to uh, uh, include some resources in your applications, and also DX, this command that we talked about before, which converts the Java bytecode to the Dalvik executable bytecode that is then run by the phone itself. And uh, all of these, again, are specific to each of the platform, and that's why they are separate from the platform tools themselves. Now, um, in order for us to start working with uh, Eclipse, it is useful, I think, to be able to, oh, that's interesting. It is useful for us to be able to uh, look at the IDE itself. And so this, I think the very first time you open it, it can be a little overwhelming. There's a lot of buttons, there's a lot of stuff, and right now I've sort of simplified the view a little bit, but there's even like another window on the right side. And if you have a, a if you're on a laptop screen, for example, it can really start to feel a little bit cramped. But realize that there are a couple of interesting and useful things that come with Eclipse. First of all, there's a, a window that pops up the very first time you open it, asking you what workspace you want to use. And what this means is basically a workspace is just a folder hierarchy that includes all of the projects that you're working on. And most people, uh, I would say, yeah, I would say it's, it's sort of usual for most people to work with one workspace. But in the case of, of everybody here, it might actually be useful for you to have multiple workspaces. You could, have, you could have one workspace just for your projects for E75, for example. Then you could have a separate workspace, which is only used for your own personal Android projects. Maybe you're actually working on a project for work or for your own sort of personal edification. You can actually make these separate workspaces. And that means that the projects that are visible on the far left side of the Eclipse window that you see right here, which include right now activity 01 through activity 10, some of which we will actually be going over in class today, uh, you can actually have different sets of projects. And this is sort of a useful thing. And one of the things that I found to be particularly useful, actually, just sort of a, a pro tip, is if you have multiple computers, um, it's actually useful if you are very diligent about closing Eclipse, it's neat to have the workspace in a Dropbox folder, and then that syncs across multiple computers, and you can have the same workspace available on, on one computer, like I have on my laptop, and then also another works, or the same workspace available on the desktop computer. Of course, there are pitfalls to this. Yes, I know. Don't email me about, um, oh, but it can become corrupted. I, I'm fully aware that it can. Just depends on how diligent you are with maintaining the workspace, making sure that you quit it. Um, uh, as appropriate every time. Okay, so we can see on the left side a variety of projects that we are working on. And basically, when you create a new Android project, you're going to go to uh, this, essentially the file menu, which is off screen right now, and then there is an Android project section. And when you click on that, then, you're pres then you are presented with another window that is, again, sort of overwhelming. But if we go through each of these options one by one, it becomes a little bit more tame. It becomes a little bit easier to deal with. So the first one is the project name. And generally, if you're working on a project for this class, uh, then we will give you, we will specify the project name for you. Like this most recent one, I think is something like, um, oh shoot, I forgot because I wrote it last week. It's something like setup and then your HUID, uh, which is eight numbers or like hello and eight numbers or something like that. But in either case, you can type a project name here. So now basically you're almost always going to want to create a new project. And that's what that first option is up here. I'll zoom in a little bit so it becomes a little bit easier to read. Uh, you can use the default location, which right now is just in my Eclipse workspace. And, right, and then you have to select a build target. And this is where you have to put perhaps a little bit of thought into it. You can change it at a later point in time if you want, but what you are telling uh, the SDK is what version of the Android OS, the earliest version of the Android OS that you want your application to run. And generally, I'm going to suggest that you use the earliest one that you can get away with. And so generally, that is going to be for the latest set of platform tools, Android 1.5. So you can select the, uh, and the build target is that, and then there are a variety of, of properties that you have to give your application at the very bottom of the window, including an application name, which doesn't, as you can tell, doesn't necessarily have to match the, um, uh, the project name, but this is what is going to appear on your Android device when you're looking at the, at the menu uh, full, of, uh, full of applications. This is what's going to appear in that case. So this will be something like a Hello World application. Then you need to select a package name. And this is related to just, uh, this gives it a, a namespace basically so that it is separate from all of the other packages that you are working on at a particular moment in time. And generally, the convention is sort of a, a reverse domain name, if that makes sense. So generally what you would see is something like com and then your, um, your uh, name or your, um, 
uh, your company's name, so like com and then Google dot and then the name of your project or something like that. But for all of the um, packages or all of the applications that you work on for this, we will use a reverse domain name for our, uh, for our class, so net.cs76, and then something sort of unique. And this does have to be unique, and so generally you would do like hello and then perhaps your user ID, just like we have specified again in the setup, um, in the setup instructions for this. And so you wouldn't write you know, that many number of Xs, but you would instead replace that with your actual user ID, and that ensures that when we load your project that the package name is unique and separate from everybody else's. And that just helps minimize some problems that we can run into. Now, create activity. We're going to talk a little bit later about what an activity actually is. But, uh, but basically, for now, we can just think of this as a window. Just think of this as the first window that opens when you open an Android application. You have to give it a name. And it's going to be a class, a Java class. So you have to name it in the same Java conventions that we've been using for class names. That means that the first letter should be capitalized, like uh, hello. And then if you have subsequent words, there can be no spaces. They should be camel cased, so on and so forth. So we'll just do hello world, something like this, just to make it relatively easy. Now, minimum SDK version. This is the minimum version of the SDK that your uh, application will run. Uh, if You don't have to fill it out necessarily, but it might be a good idea to do so. And it is the number that correlates with the earliest number that you've checked checked in the build target. So right now we've checked version 3. So the minimum SDK version that we can run for this uh, application is going to be version 3. So when, with that, and I hit finish, we basically have created our very first Android application. And if I show this to you, we can see a variety of things. First, we see in this hierarchy, we see this uh, hello, which is the project name. And then there's a couple of folders that are, that are children to this hello project. Source, gen, which is generated Java files. We're generally not going to be touching any of those in there. Android 1.5, which is the, uh, the SDK version that we selected. And this is mostly documentation. We're not going to touch stuff in there. Assets, uh, this is, we can put stuff in this assets folder, uh, but we're not going to for now. And res, which includes some resources. And we will start talking about what some of these resources are in just a little bit. But they include things like the layout, some values, some other stuff that's actually going to be useful for us as we start working with these projects. And then a couple of very important project files that have to be included, most notably the Android manifest. So this is the typical hierarchy for an Android, uh, uh, for an Android program. It's going to be this, a source, uh, a source folder, a resource folder, an Android manifest, and some of the subfolders that exist within each. And so this is important. But luckily, again, Eclipse abstracts all of this. It makes it very easy for us. It automatically creates all of this based on the names that we've provided. So notice that the package name is there under the source, and the Java file name is the name of that activity that we had just created just a moment ago. Now, this Android uh, manifest.xml file is actually very important. It specifies a number of properties about the Android program itself that you have just created. So when you want to open a file in Eclipse, you can double click it. You'll notice that um, on the right side here, we have a couple of tabs depending on the file that's open. We have hello.java and hello manifest, uh, the, the manifest file for the hello project. And along the bottom, take a, take a look that we have some more sub-tabs as well. So there's, there's a number of things within uh, Eclipse that try to help us. Uh, so just to give you an example, and hopefully I'm not getting too far ahead of myself, if we want to take a look at the layouts, for example, we can actually see that one of the sub-tabs actually shows us the layout that we had created in an XML file, which is nice. But one of the other sub-tabs is that you can actually use it to look at the raw XML file. So you can either use a graphical or a text layout, depending on what you happen to be most comfortable with. So what we're looking at now is sort of Eclipse's helper uh, to this manifest file. We can see a number of things like the package name, the version code, the version name. And by the way, this is probably a good time to mention some of these things. The version code is an integer, and it always starts, it should always start relatively low for your first release. And this is useful uh, for, um, I mean, this is basically useful not only on the Android marketplace, but also when you release your, or if you release your Android package files, your APK files, just somewhere on the internet, it's useful to pay attention to this version code. Every time you create a new version, you should increment this version code by one. And this should be irrespective of whatever version you're actually naming it. So for example, if you have uh, version 1.0 of your app, and then 1.1, and then 1.2, and then you jump to 
That, that's fine, you can do that. That's appropriate for version name, which is just a string and has no bearing on Android's calculation of the actual version of the program. But what Android code is used for is that uh, Android, the, the, uh, the operating system, makes a determination based on this integer which version that you're installing is newer. If you're installing an older version than, than what is already installed, if what you have installed uh, is older than the version that you are installing, it is based on this integer right here. So you basically don't want to do anything fancy with this version code, just with every release incremented by one. That's going to be the easiest thing for you to do. And whatever version you want to name it, now this version code will never be released publicly. It will not be shown publicly to end users, whether on the marketplace or on the device itself. But what they will see is the version name, which again is just a string. And here is where you can name it whatever you want, like 1.0a, for example, just to represent an alpha version of this. And this has, but this um, is useful for end users, but has no bearing on the, the version calculation that Android actually uses. So if you really wanted to confuse your users, you could start high and uh, move down as, as you went over time. But obviously, I don't actually recommend this. It's just sort of something that you could do if you really wanted to do. Okay, but this is the GUI representation of the manifest file itself. What does it actually look like? Well, for that, we can click on the Android manifest.xml sub tab that's found at the bottom of the page. And we can see this is just sort of the default file for the XML, for the Android Manifest XML. And so you can see that it is essentially just an, uh, an XML file in an Android namespace. And it has a couple of interesting things, like you'll see that right here there's a uses SDK element that tells the, the minimum SDK version that we can use for this, um, for this application, which the, uh, the OS will actually look at and compare its current version against this to make sure that you can actually run this version that you are trying to install. Uh, and then there's a couple of other things, like there's an icon, there's, uh, there's a, a label for the application itself. We'll talk about what all of these things are uh, in, in a little while, but for now, just realize that all of this is necessary and useful for even the most basic of applications. And what does the most basic of applications look like? It looks like this. And we'll, we'll talk about what this code does in just a little bit, but just realize that there's, no, there's some important differences between this and the Java files that we had seen before. Most notably, there's things like, uh, or there's no, go away. There's no main uh, function, there's no main method. There is, in fact, what we are doing is we have a class called Hello World, as you can see, that it extends activity. Then there's a couple of methods that are involved here. So each of these is different. It makes Android a little bit different than, um, than, what we were, than what we are perhaps used to elsewhere. And I'm just going to give you a small hint where we actually declare the main method, so to speak, or the main activity is in this intent filter in the manifest file. You can see that we have specified uh, and uh, this, this action is being the main action for this, particular, uh, uh, for this particular application. But again, we'll talk about what an activity is uh, in, just a, in just a few moments time. Now, what do I want to do or what happens when I actually want to compile this application? Well, I select my project and assuming that I have no errors, what I'm going to do is run it or I'm going to compile this with this icon up here, this little green play button. And it gives me a, uh, a choice of what I want to run this application as. Generally, unless you know that it's going to be something else, it's almost always going to be the Android application. So you select that, hit OK, and what happens is, OK, yes, you have to save the file. You'll notice that at the very bottom of the Eclipse window here, do we see some stuff happening. Uh, what Right now what's happening is that it was compiling the application, packaging it into an APK file, using that DX tool, and then converting it uh, using the zip align and all of this fancy stuff. And then what it does is it tries to load uh, in either an emulated device or a physical device, and it puts this APK file on that either emulated or physical device and runs it automatically. And so what this looks like then on an actual device is this. Uh, so we have, all right, so it's sideways, but here you can see what we have. And it's, there's not a lot going on. Maybe if I zoom in a little bit, you can see that it says, hello world, it's the most basic of applications, but it is running on a physical device. So, okay, what happens then if this is running on an emulated device? Well, realize that it really is no different than running, uh, than running it on a physical device. In fact, it's, um, it's essentially the same thing. What will happen is that, uh, let's see, uh, 
what will happen is that, and this is on a different computer, uh, is that the emulator will open automatically and it will load. Now the reason that I have, you might be wondering, well, why on earth is he showing us the emulator on a different computer with Eclipse in the background? The reason for that is that my computer is slow and ancient, and literally, it literally takes 20 minutes for the emulator to load on my laptop. So I don't use the emulator on my laptop. In fact, instead, this is on a, a computer at home, a Mac Pro, which is a lot faster and a lot more reasonable to load the emulator. But assuming your, your computer is powerful enough to load this, uh, it will load just fine and the application will be compiled and run in this window in the emulated version right here. Yes. Ah yes, so how do you configure the emulator that you need? That's a very good segue to the next part that we're going to talk about, which brings us to, again, back to this Android SDK and AVD manager. Now, again, the setup PDF sort of guides you through this, and there's an, and sections and uh, labs and office hours are a great way to get some additional help on this. But basically, you can see that we have a list of virtual devices in this Android application, this SDK and AVD manager. So from virtual devices, we have a couple of AVDs, but these are already created. If you want to create a new one, you go all the way to the right side and click New. Then you give it a name, and usually I give the name of the AVD, uh, I base the name off of the features that's provided. So perhaps the operating system version it has and the, and the whatever hardware uh, features I've selected for this particular emulated device. So in this case, I usually wait a little while to give it a name. I usually skip that at first and I try it and I pick first um, the version of Android that I want it to run. So if I want it to run maybe the, the preview version of Honeycomb, I can select the Android Honeycomb preview and that sort of gives me a clue as to what I'm going to name this, Honeycomb. Now, there's a couple of other things here like SD card, snapshot, skin, a whole bunch of other stuff. You really don't have to worry about this unless you know what you want. I would leave everything else at its default and just select a, uh, a name and a target for it and then click Create AVD. And what will happen there is that you will then see a new AVD uh, listed here. So from there, you can then start the AVD outside of the context of Eclipse, and what I mean by that is that it will not actually load a, an application that you have just created. You can actually load one of these uh, devices and actually use it as though it were a, an actual device, save for those limitations that we saw on that slide just a little while ago. Uh, so just to sort of humor everybody, I will click Start, but this is actually pretty useful. A lot of the latest versions of the API uh, um, uh, support hardware devices that have very, very high resolution screens. And sometimes these high resolution screens exceed the resolution of tiny, crappy laptops like mine. And so sometimes you have to scale the device, the, the display on the device to match that, uh, to be something comfortable on your own screen. And that is what this window is actually uh, is, is asking us. So we can tell this window to scale the display to actual size. And notice that there's two things, a screen size and a monitor DPI. You can calculate the monitor DPI by selecting your screen size and it automatically configures the resolution. And from there it configures the monitor DPI for my particular screen, which is 113 dots per inch. Then with that, it knows uh, how to scale the virtual device, the display on the virtual device, on, the, on the, the display on the, the virtual device, oof, I'm sorry, uh, to match the screen size that you've input up there. So saying that I want three inches uh, with the, that particular monitor DPI means that when I load this, it will display to be three inches on my uh, on my screen as well. So generally that's a little bit too small, so I'll try six. And so we'll see <clears throat> what happens and hopefully what happened last year when I did this class sometimes is that this would just lock up the entire computer for a little while. Um, and that was actually kind of embarrassing while well, we would just chat about, you know, people's days and ask how the weekend went while I waited for things to, uh, to happen. But we will move on. But basically what's happening on the other screen over here is that it is, this device is loading. And you can see that this is sort of wide because this honeycomb preview is meant to be a, a, a preview of the tablet version of the OS that we are talking about. So rather than wait for this to hose my machine, I will cancel this and we will move on. Now one of the things that's important, you may ask the question, well how can I, how do I know which of these emulated devices uh, if you have multiple, especially, my code is going to run on. Well, you can actually take a look back at, the, uh, at this little green button over here. Right next to it, there's a little triangle. And if you click on that, there you can, you'll notice that there's a run configurations selection. If you click on that, you'll notice that we have 
a variety of configurations that are available, including all of the activities that we see right there, and also this Hello app that we are starting to work on. And so generally, you want to select the project that you're working on, and then up here in the target menu, you can select um, uh, which devices that it will use, or if you really want to have it ask you what you want to do, you can, uh, you can always uh, manually select the version that you want. And so in this case, if I have it set on manual, uh, then what I will do is try to run it again. And what we will see is that, okay, I can either choose to uh, run this application on a connected Android device or actually run a virtual device. And so I can run this program in any number of my emulated or physical devices. Now, if you have a physical device, it's actually relatively trivial to connect it to your computer and get it to work in this fashion. Now, um, if you have a device like uh, an HTC Evo or a Nexus One that you've seen, generally what you have to do in order to get this work is just a couple step process. And for that, we'll come back here to this screen. And come on, there we go. Now, what we want is to go to the home menu and then you click on the menu button and go to settings. And from here you click on applications. And what we're doing right now is telling this hardware device that I want to use it for development. And what that means is that it is going to allow the computer pretty much full access to it, to, allow, to install applications on it, to pull and push data files to the device and from the device, and, uh, and uh, basically do some debugging things and, and have shell access, that sort of thing. And so you'll notice that right here there's a development uh, section and from there there are two choices that are selected and I apologize if it's a little hard to read but the top two are what is selected USB debugging and I just have selected stay awake just for the purposes of lecture just so that this phone is always on. Allow mock locations if you start working with GPS that might be useful as well but not really uh, necessary in this case. So okay so now you've told your physical device that you want to uh, use it for debugging so the next step is to get a USB cable and connect it to the, the device itself and then to your computer. Now, if you happen to be um, lucky enough to be on a Mac, or I should say if you're unlucky to be on either Windows or a Linux PC, you have some additional steps. But on a Mac, it becomes very, very easy. You are essentially done with that. And so, uh, let's see. Right here, I have uh, I brought up a, um, uh, a terminal window. And I've CD'd or I've changed the directory to match that of the platform tools. Recall there's that, uh, that ADB program that I had mentioned before, which that Android debug bridge, which allows us to uh, do a variety of things to either emulate it or, or, uh, or actual devices. Well, I need to use that right now to prove that this is actually running. And so I've CD'd to it. And we can see ADB is available there. So if I run uh, period slash ADB devices, we will see what is actually connected. And right now we can see the serial number of my device and see that it is actually connected to this machine. So on a Mac, I'm done. This means that it's connected and I can use Eclipse as I've just shown you using that green little run button to run this and, and use it appropriately. If you're on Windows or Linux, there's a few extra steps. I recommend going, of course, to the developer site. They have a list of, of things that you have to do on either platform to get this particular thing set up on your machine. Now again, this is actually, this is useful, I think, to be able to um, run uh, 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 your program on a physical device, but it's not going to be very comprehensive. It's good to have a number of emulated devices and test your application on all of those just so that you're sure that it works on a variety of operating systems, just so that you're sure that it runs on a variety of different hardware platforms that have different hardware support and that have um, maybe different resolution screens so that your layout is actually effective on each of these screens. That's going to be important for you to try, not just to rely solely on your one physical device and be sure that it works great on that one device, but you're not quite so sure on other devices. So this is something that is going to be um, useful to you. So what happens now if I want to actually debug some code? Well, realize that um, it's, it's, uh, there's a variety of, um, there's a variety of, of different uh, perspectives that Eclipse actually has that, uh, that changes basically the, the window, the contents of the window, depending on the goal that you have uh, for your particular task. So in this case, this is the context to write Java code. We can see our projects on the left. We see our source code here in the center. We, saw, we see our console down here. And it's pretty useful for us in this context. But if I want to start debugging, then you'll notice that there are some other 
uh, contexts that are available in the upper left, uh, rather in the upper right hand corner, including debug, which is useful for debugging, and uh, DDMS, which is, allows us, well here I'll just show you, this allows us access to some, of the, uh, to some of the things on the device itself. So we can actually see that there is this hardware device that's connected. Uh, if it was an emulated device, we would be able to see, or we would be able to change some, some properties of that emulated device. We could also potentially see some of the files that exist on this actual device and on an emulated device as well. And there's a couple of other things up there that are useful as well, like the heap and uh, allocation tracker. Now, if you actually want to debug, though, the more useful perspective, I think, is this debug perspective, which changes it to still include your source code, but it also includes some other things like a debug window up there. So if you actually cause some sort of problem uh, that's, that, that occurs at runtime, you'll be able to run or you, you'll be able to um, take a look at what um, uh, what the problem actually is. And uh, you'll notice additionally that there is a log section down here called Logcat, which is available also from the ADB, uh, the ADB software itself. But it's also, um, because everything in Eclipse is provided to you very nicely here, it's also available here. Now you can actually issue uh, statements to the log and view them either here from your, uh, from your application or in, via the ADB, just so that you can use that as sort of a debugging tool. And I'll show you how to use that in a little while as well. So um, let's see. Now with all of this, I think this is a pretty good uh, way of, of going about this, but there is another thing that I wanted to show you that's specific to emulated devices. And this is, I think, is another reason why emulated devices um, are, are perhaps a pretty nice to use when you're actually um, uh, developing some software. So I'm gonna go back to my computer here. Now we're gonna notice that on an emulated device, what I see at the very top are two things in the title bar of this emulated device. First is a number, and this number is still kind of small even though I've zoomed in. We can see it says 5554 and then a colon and then the ABD name. But that number we should pay attention to. Remember that number. That is useful for us because what this allows us to do is to actually connect via Telnet to this emulated, at this emulated device at that number, at that port number, and issue other types of commands. So whereas ADB allows us to install files and look at logs and redirect standard out and standard error, we can actually tell the emulator to do a variety of kind of cool things just programmatically. So uh, over here I have, oh, just to show you if I run ADB devices here, what this looks like for an emulated device is it actually says emulator instead of the serial number of the device. So it says emulator and then that same number that we had seen before. And so if you have multiple emulators running and a hardware device shown uh, and a hardware device connected, you will see all of those things. But what, uh, what is actually more useful is to do this. So from your computer, whether it be Linux, Mac, or Windows, you run this command, telnet, localhost, and then the number representing the port that you saw at the title uh, at the very top, the title of that window. And what will happen is that, uh, at least in this case, it will connect after a while, and we can see what sort of commands are available to us. And just to show you some of these neat things, there are things like geolocation commands so that we can actually, hey, what's going on? Stop it. So we can actually issue, or we can actually change the geolocation, oof, sorry, hold on. So we can actually change, oh, don't you be like this. Oh, okay. I can't, I can't win today. Oh, no. Okay, I'm going to quit this and then we're going to re restart. But you can see that there are a couple of things like geolocation which actually allow us uh, to connect to, or not to connect, but to specify the geo coordinates. And actually, we could do this programmatically as well, such that we would then be able to, uh, using a script or something, move the GPS coordinates along some track. So if our application actually involves something like, um, uh, like using a, uh, let's see, here we go. This should work better. All right. Now, uh, then, oh, it's still not. Okay, here we go. This is it. Okay, not going to rock the boat. I'm not going to touch it now. So now we can see a couple of things like, so if I wanted to actually issue a variety of, uh, of geo uh, coordinates that I wanted to move it along a certain path, then I could do that. I can also do some things like, uh, um, like actually send it a text message. 
even though it's not an actual text message, it simulates the action of the phone receiving a text message. I can also manage some network settings. So I can, for example, slow down the internet to simulate a really crappy connection, for example, or increase the latency by quite a bit. Uh, there are some other things that I can do, like uh, I can change the power status so that if my uh, application depends on the, the battery level, for example, then I can actually see how it is impacted by each of those. And so, uh, just to show you one of these, I will send an SMS to the uh, the device, so we can see uh, by doing help SMS, I can see how to do this. Okay, so SMS send, um, SMS send from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, and then the, the message, hello, and when I hit enter, it says okay, and now in the emulated device, after it usually takes a couple of seconds, you can now see the notification that I've received uh, for this SMS, and so you can simulate a variety of things, including phone calls and uh, different geo, uh, different geolocation data, just through using this this Telnet application. Now, this Telnet does not this Telnet trick does not work for a physical device. The reason for that is, I suppose, you could actually send it a text message, or you could actually give it a call. But this is one of the ways that the emulator actually gives us uh, 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 like a an advantage over some of the physical devices themselves. Okay, let's take a quick five minute break and when we come back we'll continue talking about the Android SDK. Hello everyone, welcome back. So uh, I do just want to make one quick announcement. So the section that happens immediately after lecture has actually been moved. It's now in this room. So don't go anywhere afterwards if you want to stick around for lecture. And it is still being uh, videotaped, but it just makes it a little bit easier for us with the video camera uh, and for all of you so you don't have to um, shift too much. Though it might still be good to get up and stretch just a little bit. So before the break, we were talking about um, uh, communicating with the emulator via a console. And so we, we use the console port that's available to us. And so the shortcut to, to finding that was via the number that was at the very top of the title bar. So you could use that and know which port to connect using Telnet in order to issue commands to the emulator. But if you have multiple emulators open, it actually follows this general pattern where the first emulator that's open is 5554, like you saw, and then every additional emulator after that adds two. So the reason that we go every other one is that ADB actually connects, I believe, to uh, the odd numbered versions. So 5555 is connected by, uh, by the, by the uh, ADB device or by the ADB server rather than uh, for this. And so using, you can use the, this local or the, this Telnet trick to issue commands to it and, and run a variety of things uh, that might be useful as you debug your application. So we had mentioned before, um, a couple of weeks ago actually, so the breakdown of some of the operating systems that exist in Android and the, and, uh, the way that it is installed across the, the user base, like we saw a couple of weeks ago, was basically like this, where the majority actually, and this was pretty good, the majority were using at the time the latest uh, publicly available version, Android 2.2. Now we have the, the even, even more recent version available, Android 2.3, so that has been sort of, that's not, everybody has installed that quite yet, and in fact it's not really a been uh, too, I'm not even sure that it's, it's available on some of the, the Google phones themselves, like the Nexus quite yet, so I don't think we'll see huge adoption of that quite yet, but right now, uh, at least from a couple of weeks ago, we saw this breakdown with a vast vast majority of the people were using Android 2.1 or higher and uh, the lower, I don't know, sixth or so, were using about Android 1.5 and Android 1.6. So even if you have APIs that are uh, only available in Android version 2, you might be doing kind of okay with targeting your application for some of these people. But, but this was two weeks ago and the more recent data that we can find is actually this where we now have even greater adoption of Android 2.2. So obviously the upward trend is that we are seeing more people using the latest versions that are available. And in fact, right now, version 2.2, 57.6% of the Android devices that are out there that have accessed the marketplace in a given two-week period are using Android 2.2. And from there, 2.1 is 31.4%, so that by itself is a very pretty good significant chunk of the population. Then 1.6 is at uh, 6% and 1.5 is basically at 4% and then 2.3 is just a little sliver of the percentage of people that have accessed the marketplace. And so we've talked about how there's some problems, or there's, there's these perceived problems of fragmentation across the Android platform, not only because of the operating system, but also the hardware itself. 
Well, um, Google also releases this graph to try to help us with uh, that idea as well. And this is the, the distribution of screen sizes and their densities across people that have used a variety of devices. Now, this data is quite a bit older. This is from July of last year as opposed to just last week. But it still does, it still does show us some of the breakdowns where the, uh, pretty much everybody is using a normal resolution screen at either medium or high resolution. Uh, or no, medium or high dots per inch. And so what that means is that uh, uh, it's a normal size with, with, with either uh, quite a few dots or quite a lot of dots. And so the vast majority of people are using that. And uh, pretty much everybody else is either using a small, uh, a small screen with low DPI or uh, a medium-sized screen with, uh, with low DPI. But uh, the nice thing about the Android SDK that we, will, uh, that we will start to see when we start talking about resources is that it becomes actually relatively easy uh, in um, using some of this folder hierarchy to design assets and resources for your application that will work on a variety of devices. So you might have some images that are higher resolution for the high resolution devices and some lower resolution images for lower resolution devices. And naming them in a specific way actually will target uh, the, those devices that that content has been created for. So it's sort of a, it's a pretty good solution, I think, it, even though when we start talking about it, it'll be kind of a little mind boggling just because there's a lot of options that are involved. But it is, I think, at least a reasonable solution for the, the, the sort of problem that we have right now. So we've seen in application, your very first Android application. In fact, um, don't look at this too hard because obviously this is the sort of the solution, if you will, to uh, Project 2, where the setup project really was meant to be very easy. It's supposed to get you set up with Eclipse, get you started using it, use the emulated devices, poke around on these in these AVDs a little bit, perhaps use uh, this ADB, uh, this ADB software and this Telnet trick to try playing around with some stuff and see what you can do. And really, what was secondary was creating your first Android application. But what does all of this stuff actually mean? Well, in order for us to start talking about what's going on in this code, even though you can look at it and sort of get a sense of what's going on, some of the words, some of the, 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 the diction that they're using may not make a lot of sense initially. Realize that an application in Android is, is sort of a nebulous thing. When you create an APK file, that is an application. But really, the, the term application kind of ends there with the creation of this APK file. The reason for that is when you load what you would call an application on your phone, it, that one application, which actually Google calls tasks and which we will call tasks from here on out, is that this task can actually be made up of multiple applications. So let's imagine for a moment that you are creating an application uh, um, and this application is going to have some capability that involves a map, just as an example. So perhaps you don't want to create a map on your own, but maybe you want to use a map that's available from, say, the Google Map application or one of the other uh, Google Maps APIs that's, that's available through Android. Well, this can actually create a separate sort of application that is run on top of yours. And it's all very seamless to the end user. For those of you that have, that have Android phones and have used Android phones, this might sound sort of like a little bit crazy in that, I mean, it's very seamless. You open an application and you would see a window and then maybe another window would open on top of it and you would see that window and it was very seamless. But the point is that the, with the way that the Android SDK is created, the way that Android programs are created, is that you can actually pull activities, what are called activities, from other applications and request that they be placed on top of yours so that a user can actually have some functionality that's provided by some other application within your own application. And you can do the same thing. You can make aspects of your application available to others as well. So uh, another example might be something like, um, I don't know, like, uh, so use this Dropbox example again. Maybe your application has access to Dropbox and you want to load up the login screen. Perhaps the Dropbox application actually has an activity that allows you to log in and does it within the context of the Dropbox application. You can actually load up that activity. I'm not sure if that's actually the case, but that's just an example of what this sort of thing actually allows us to do. So this is why we don't call programs that run on Android applications necessarily. And a lot of the, the terminology that you will see involves these tasks, where tasks are basically just a, co a collection of activities. And each activity is itself just what we would consider uh, 
a window. So when we actually looked at an application, when we looked at that application that was running on, the, um, on this device, let's see if I can bring this back up, uh, activity 01, okay, so when we have basically this, we, we loaded a task that started an activity, and an activity is this black window that you see with text that's right there. Now this is very, this is, I mean, the most simple, the most basic of applications that exist, but this does actually um, uh, show you what sort of things that we can expect from an activity. Now we can have other activities that would be placed on top of this. Let's imagine for a moment that you're doing something like, uh, uh, I don't know, creating an SMS app, just as an example. And so you might have uh, an activity that allows you to write the, um, the, the SMS that you are creating. And there's at the very top of this activity a text box for you to type in a user's phone number, just as an example. But imagine that could all be contained within one activity, right? The phone number and then the body that you want to send to this user. But imagine that you have a little button there as well. And what this button does is load the contact list. Well, that would be a separate activity. You push this button and a new window, if you will, appears on top of what of this current activity, new window appears, and that is a new activity in our task. So now our task is composed of two activities, or two windows, if you will, that are layered on top of the other. And basically, it's this stack of activities, and this entire stack is what we would call one task. And when we load up something like the, um, the task manager in Android, what we are seeing are not actually individual applications, uh, but they are, in fact, tasks of which are, are, are uh, these stacks of activities. Now whether or not those activities all come from the same application is really sort of dependent on how they wrote these applications. So this is why we have to be careful with our vocabulary that we're using. Just because it's, it's, you can create an application that uses portions of other applications as well, other activities. So just this contact manager, just to come back to the same example, we could perhaps use the contact manager that's provided by Android, and that could be an activity that's placed on top of ours. So now we have our activity, then on top of that, an Android activity. And, and in combination, we would consider that a task though we might be tempted to call it an application, even though those activities come from two different applications. Hopefully, does this make sense? Because this is very important for us. When we start talking about activities, as you'll see, the very first thing that we can do, our Hello World application only has one activity, but it's important to make this distinction early, because as we start creating additional activities, as we start using uh, some other APIs that call other activities, this becomes a factor for us. And in fact, the, the manifest file does actually use the terminology task when we're talking about each of these things. Okay, so we have, yeah. Yes, so that's, that's actually the tie-in that I was about to make. So every activity is actually one class. So you will create one class that has its own methods for that window or for that activity. So in our Hello World application, just as an example, we have one activity because we only have the most basic, just one window, and we have, all the, we have a minimum number of methods uh, created for that activity. And in fact, that's what's going on in the very first line of this Hello World application. Public class Hello World, which is the class name that we've defined, extends activity. So notice that we are creating acti in an, ac an activity, but we are inheriting the properties of that in our own class. Did I see a question? You mentioned that uh, you can uh, pull activities on two, two, two different programs. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have an example to show that? Do I have an example to show of that in, in code, you mean? Well, it wasn't um, not, not, nothing that I want to show you right now, just because the code is, is complex enough. We'll start, when we start talking about uh, things like intents, then this will make a lot more sense. This is just right now meant to be a bit more informational about how this is structured and we'll work our way up to actually uh, pulling other activities from, from other applications at a later so point. I'm thinking because the application is running inside OS, right? Mm -hmm. That means you have to actually activate two applications at the same time? Yes, so this is one of the points that we had made before where the Dalvik virtual machine is actually optimized to run multiple uh, virtual machines and multiple applications at the same time. And this is actually, um, you'll notice that we do not have
a main method. We've been talking about this last week and now again this week, where each of uh, even our basic, most basic application doesn't have a main method. And the reason for that is that Android will actually run only portions of the program that it deems are necessary dependent on the context. So if, for example, my activity calls for another activity from another application, it's not going to load the entire program. It's only going to run an, or instantiate a version of that activity class that inherited an activity class that it needs to run in order for it to work. So it basically just pulls whatever it needs to do. And in fact, we, uh, an application can be made up of more than just activities. There's also things like services, which is basically like an application that would run in the background. So if you wanted to have uh, something that, that GPS tracker app, for example, if you wanted to make a more sophisticated version of it that ran in the background that was constantly pulling your information, even though the app wasn't in the foreground, there was no activity in the foreground representing the GPS tracking, that could still be running as a service in the background. And so that application is still running, it's just that that activity is not running. So that's another example. There's uh, some other things that applications can do. They can be broadcast receivers. So sometimes some events will occur in the Android OS that will cause, a, a broadcast, uh, will cause an event to be broadcast out to applications. Uh, for example, if I think uh, some things like uh, if the, uh, the status of the AC adapter changes or if, the, if a text message is received or some things like that, then you, the, some, an event will be broadcast and you can create a, a broadcast receiver, which is again separate from this idea of a service and separate from this idea of an activity that will run code whenever this, this event has been broadcasted and received and you can do something based on the, the, this broadcasted event that had happened. There's also other things like content providers, uh, which is a bit more abstract, but basically if you, are, uh, if you want to make available some data to other programs as well, then that's something that you would do um, through there. And all of, these, um, all, of these, all of this code, you can actually have an application that does all of these things. It can be broadcast receiver, it can have a service, and it can have an activity, but all of this, what defines all of this and what meshes it all together is that Android manifest file. It is that file that defines all of the aspects of the application that we actually have. And so just to uh, show you this same idea once again, if I have my manifest file, uh, we can actually see some of the things in my application. So you'll notice that there's the manifest element that's sort of the, the parent element to all of this stuff. Then there's an application element. And this application element actually defines all of the aspects of my application so that the Android OS knows what it can run. If you were to create another activity but not define it in the manifest file, that activity cannot be run just because the Android OS does not know about it. So everything has to be defined within this manifest file. And you can see that we have only one activity within this application. And that is that hello world activity that we saw before. Now the intent filter is what actually allows us to, and we'll, we'll talk more about intents I think next week, but the, the intent filter is what allows us to, uh, to specify which activities can actually be run by other applications and, and that sort of thing. So that if I wanted this activity to be called by another application, then I would specify or I would modify this intent filter uh, in some specified way. Okay. Now, moving on just a little bit. So we're talking about um, this code. So um, this, this task, this application could just be a stack of activities and it doesn't necessarily have to be activities that are all from the same application. But in the most basic example, in this case, our application does map very easily, very well to just one activity. So we have one application is the same thing as a task, is the same thing as one activity, but that's just in this oversimplified example. So that's why we're, we're making this differentiation now, just because when we start making more complex programs, this will make a little bit more sense. Now notice at the very top of the file that we have to define our package name. So this is the same name, and again, um, Eclipse will actually do all of this for you. And as you saw, just creating a default Android uh, uh, application in Eclipse will essentially create the Hello World application for you with all of this sort of text that exists here. Well, I think it's a little bit different, but this is basically a version of the Hello World application. Next, we have to import some packages just so that we know, so that we're able to, um, uh, so our application is able to know some of these things that it's working with, like this activity class. We don't know necessarily what it is offhand, but importing the Android dot app dot activity allows us to do that. Again, this is all handled automatically. And if you notice an API that exists in the, uh, in, uh, the Android documentation and you decide to start implementing it, Eclipse will actually uh, give you a little warning sign and will actually automatically import the appropriate package uh, 
uh, for you. So it, it really makes easy a lot of the things that uh, might that could be a little bit of a pain. So okay, so we have the activity and it's been defined in the manifest file and you'll notice that uh, our class extends this activity and implements and in fact overrides a function called onCreate and in fact the activity class itself has a number of methods that are associated with it. In particular there's the onCreate method that you just saw that we had overridden in the most basic example of our application. Then there's also things like onStart, onRestart, on resume, on pause, on stop, on destroy. What do all of these mean? Well, realize that an activity has what is essentially a life cycle. It's not just something that opens and exists. And there's a, a sequence of steps that is involved in order for that activity to come to the foreground and be displayed to the user. But there's also, in the case that another activity is, comes in front of it, there's also a sequence of steps for, uh, for that activity to perform some like saving of files or saving of data just in case something happens. So in the case of the activity lifecycle, it actually looks something like this. And I know it's a little bit small and I'll zoom in on it on just a little bit, but the overview is this. The activity starts at the blue oval at the very, very top. And it goes from there, when the activity is started, it, it, um, Android will then call the onCreate method of our extended activity. Then from there it will start the activity so it will call on start. Then from there it will call on resume and then after all of this has happened will the activity finally be running and that's our, our sort of green circle or our green oval in the center. Now let's assume for a moment that our activity for some reason or another puts another activity in front of it so that our activity is now obscured in some way. It calls on pause. And what this allows us to do is when this, this function, or when this method rather, is called by the, the operating system, or by our task more specifically, then that allows us to do things with the data that we have on our activity. So in the case of our SMS app, maybe what we would want to do is save some of that data just into some sort of local storage or equivalent on Android, just so that we would then be able to recall that data in case that activity is actually quit. Keep in mind that once an activity has been paused, it's possible for that activity to be killed by the operating system. If the OS determines, because it's low on, on uh, CPU cycles, because it's low on memory, if it decides that it really needs to kill an activity, it will do it, but only after it has been paused. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, in, in the event that there's some really big catastrophic crash that, you know, your application won't still quit, but Android, the Android OS itself won't force your application to quit, or won't force that activity to quit, rather, until it's been paused. But this does mean that once it's been paused, it can be killed. And this is an important thing to, to realize, because if you are working with data in an activity, if, that, if you want that data to persist when another activity is displayed on top of that activity, you have to be sure to do something with that data. You want to be sure to save that data so that when the user comes back, they will still see that data, just in case it has been quit. So, if, so what basically happens is, let's say there's a, an activity that comes in front of the current activity, uh, and uh, so on pause is called. Now that topmost activity is quit. So now our original activity is shown once again, then that goes back up to on resume. The on resume method will then be called once the activity is the topmost activity once again. Now if we show another activity and that activity completely obscures the one that we are looking at, the one, the, the one that we were looking at previously, not only will our current activity be paused using on pause, but it will also be stopped with on stop. And so once that activity closes, then it's possible for after on stop has been called for our new for our old activity to come back to the foreground. We will go all the way back up to on restart and then run on start and then on resume once again. Now it's important to realize that because the user expects activities to appear relatively quickly once they've done something, so presumably they've hit the contacts button and they want their contact list to show up pretty quickly, this on pause and on resume functions, they need to be pretty lightweight, they need to be pretty fast, they can't be very heavy, otherwise what will happen is that the user will notice a little bit of a lag, because the, the new activity won't actually be loaded until on pause is actually completely finished. So it will actually block 
the new activity from loading. So keep on pause lightweight, but realize that on pause does need to be implemented to save your data or you might get into trouble because that data will be lost and you will have upset users or graders, what the, whatever the case might be. Now if, that, uh, now if the um, uh, activity has been stopped and has been deemed to be destroyed, perhaps because the application is shut down, then it will run the final method called on destroy and it will be shut down. So just to give you again an overview of this, the very top we have an activity starts, goes to on create, on start, on resume, then the activity itself is running. So if another, uh, another activity appears but does not completely obfuscate the activity below, then on pause is called, uh, then once it's come back it'll go to on resume, uh, then it's running again. So if it has been completely obfuscated for some reason, then on stop will be called after on pause. So this does actually progress linearly to, uh, in, in all cases. So it will go from on pause to on stop. Then if it's actually destroyed, it will go to on destroy and so on. Yes? Right, so if, um, if your application is quit, for some reason, so perhaps if the, uh, the Android OS, if, not, if it's not quit under some um, circumstances due to memory, in which case the, the Android OS does actually say that it can be killed after this point, then it will actually, uh, once the, if the activity is properly shut down by the user, just as an example, then it will go through to completion through this, this method here. Right. So this assumes going to the very end sort of assumes that it's been shut down intentionally by the user for some reason. But it is possible after on pause, it is possible for the task or for the activity itself to be killed. Yes? Yeah. Process is killed is, is something that's done by the Android OS when it is deemed that other applications might need the memory that are being taken up by this activity. So this is something that's forcibly done by the operating system, whereas going to the bottom of this graph here is something that's done by the user. It's intentional by the user that they actually want to close the activity because perhaps they want to quit the application. With process is killed, on stop is not called. Right. So if, well, it, de it depends. It depends where exactly in the life cycle we are. Basically, Android guarantees that this is going to happen. If an activity starts, it will happen in this order. On create, then on start, then on resume, then the activity is running, then the user can interact with it and, and work with it. Then if, if something happens such that another activity appears, depending on how, uh, how much of the activity of our previous activity is visible, if it's only partially covered, then it will still pause that activity, so it will pause that, and then it will, it will go here and just sort of wait. But if it's completely obscured by an activity that takes up the entire screen, just as an example, then it will continue to on stop. But, the, but it doesn't matter whichever point it gets to in this life cycle, whether it gets to on pause or on stop, Android reserves the right to completely kill off your activity without warning at that point. So you have to make sure, that's why at that point it's important from on pause to ensure that you have saved any data that's, uh, that's necessary for you uh, to ensure that when the activity is reopened that the user is not frustrated by, by the actions of their low memory telephone. Yes? So sure, so on, on an Android device, it's, um, it works a little bit differently than on an iPhone. So here we have, again, an Android device, and it's basically somewhat similar in that it does have a home screen, but it's not necessarily the fact that all of the applications are on the, the home screen itself. In fact, on Android, you can have some other things like widgets. Like you see up here, there's a little Google search widget, and you can have some other widgets as well. But if you actually want to bring up the list of applications, then there's usually a button of some kind, and it actually varies dependent on the skin that's installed on that Android phone. And from here, you can actually see all of the applications that are installed on the phone. So the, on here, there's a lot of stuff that's sort of been installed by default, but there's one that's right here, CS76 Lecture Activity 01, that's over here that you, that you can hopefully come into focus soon. 
That's actually um, now this application. And so running this is basically just like um, running an iPhone app where you just tap on it and it opens the application. And all of this stuff that we've been talking about is really a, a level of technical detail that most users are never going to know or care about. They're not going to know or care about the activity lifecycle. They're not going to know necessarily that a, a, an activity underneath has been killed due to low memory. And that's sort of the point of this activity lifecycle. Now, if you wanted to do the equivalent of uh, task switching, you just sort of push and hold on the home button. Did you just stop? Did you just destroy that? Like, what did you just do? So by pushing and holding the home button, it brings up now uh, this, this is um, a task switcher that's part of the Android OS. You can still see the activity in the background. So this means that my activity has not been stopped and it's not been killed, but it's been paused. But there's no code right now to sort of do anything with that on pause. It just, it's just sort of existing just because, again, this is the very, very simple version of the application. If I were to actually go back now with the back button, and that's one of the major differences, again, between the iPhone OS and Android is that you do have these four buttons. Sometimes they are actual physical buttons. Sometimes, in this case, they're soft buttons, which are just like uh, extensions of the screen, basically. And you can click uh, on each of these to go back. So rather than have a dedicated back button, or no, uh, the other way around, rather than have a back button that's implemented in the software itself, to go from a, a higher level activity to a lower level one, you would hit that back button. And then this, this button, and the sort of second from the left, is sort of a submenu button. And there, I pushed it, and there was a little vibration indicating that I pushed it. But this application does not currently have any menus uh, associated with it. Again, menus are something that we'll, we'll see in a future lecture. And then search is obviously, this, this little magnifying glass is, is a search for, uh, for Android. Yes? Uh, is there the notion on Android like there is on iOS that users cannot kill applications? That's, that's not the case. Uh, applications uh, depends, it really depends, I would say, on what is going on with the application. So I had mentioned before that an application can have a variety of different types. So there might be a service, for example, that runs in the background. And that uh, doesn't necessarily have an activity associated with it. So an example of a service, so like this GPS track, or another example might be a music player that runs in the background. And even though you don't see any buttons for music player, it's still sort of playing music. That's being played by a service in the background. But it is certainly possible to kill applications and, in fact, install them. If you're at the home screen, you can bring up the submenu. And then again, in settings, where we had before used this applications menu to, um, to deal with the development portion, so that we, we check the little box that, that allows us to do USB development. We can actually see what sort of running services are here. We can cancel them. We can actually see what sort of memory is in use in this phone. Right now, it doesn't seem like any activities are at risk of being killed, just because we have plenty of memory right now on this phone. Uh, but we can also do some things like uh, we can see what sort of applications are installed and actually uninstall them from this point, uh, which will also force them to close. You can see these are downloaded apps. These are running apps. And uh, selecting on, so you can see that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. If I select one, I can tell it to do some things, like I can force it to stop. Once it's been stopped, well, uh, this is part of the OS, so I might not be able to install it. But if this were one of my apps that, that was running, then I could force that to, uh, to uninstall. There's a variety of other things here. So, just, so the Android um, OS does provide a lot greater level of control over your applications and what is going on with the phone itself. It's just that it's, it works ever so slightly differently. And, and the biggest aspect, I think, are these, these notions of the soft buttons that exist at the bottom of the phone itself. So going back again, there's no dedicated back, or no, there is a dedicated back button. We don't have to use the built-in one to an application. We just use that back button that exists there to go to the previous activity. Yes? How does the user actually quit out of an application? They basically just hit the home button, and that application is shut down. So what happens if it's just an application that has, uh, uh, that has activities, it doesn't have any services or, or any broadcast receivers or anything like that, then that application is actually stopped, like we saw. Through that life cycle, it's paused, and then uh, it's stopped, and then it's destroyed uh, at that point. And only if it has uh, services or, or something that is intentionally meant to run in the background will that continue to run 
in the background of, of this phone. But then we could shut that down like we saw just by going to the menu, going back to the applications uh, and, and forcing a service to quit if we wanted to do that. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so with all of this said, it seems useful now to actually start taking a look at some code. And so we have seen now um, just the most basic of Hello World applications. And so what exactly is going on in this? Well, this is the source code for that Hello World application. Again, this is the default application. This is the application that, um, that is created by Eclipse for me when I first create a, an Android app. So what you will see here is that we have defined our package. We've imported all of the things that are appropriate. Notice that there's a little plus sign right there. We can actually expand that plus sign and see all of the packages that have been imported. Right now, it's sort of a minimum quantity of packages. And then we create a class that extends our activity because we want to create an activity so to be able to display something within it. Then we have to do something. Now, the one thing that you always have to do is on create. You always have to create uh, you always have to have an onCreate override. And notice that it accepts one uh, parameter. Uh, it is a saved instance state that is of type bundle. And what you should do is, even if you don't really have, um, I, mean, I mean, this would be silly, but you, ha you usually have to set the view. But um, you always have also have to, because it is uh, inherited from a superclass, you have to run the instance that is, or the method that is created by the superclass as well. So at the very beginning of all of these methods that you override, the first thing you do is super dot and then the method name and pass in any parameters that you may have received from it. And I think uh, onCreate is the only method in this case that accepts a parameter. And so you would then, in this case, the very first thing you do before anything else is super dot onCreate and then pass in the saved instance stage that we received. Yes? One of the two language questions. What is, is the at override necessary, or is that just something Eclipse puts there? And the other is, what is R? OK, so two questions were, is at override necessary, or is that something that Eclipse puts? OK, so to answer that one first, it's not required, uh, and it is something that Eclipse puts, but it is, it is a nicety in two things, in that the Java compiler will actually complain if, uh, if, so what you're doing is you were telling the compiler that you are creating a method that is supposed to override uh, something that has been created elsewhere. In this case, that has been uh, uh, created in the, um, uh, the parent class, in the super class. And so by specifying this override, let's say you do something silly like actually change the name ever so slightly, then the compiler will actually be able to know, okay, well, you're trying to override something, but this function on Crete doesn't actually exist. So this is sort of a, it's sort of a useful thing um, to you and also to the compiler so that you can also use this as an organizational tool to be able to quickly look at your code and say, okay, this method has been overridden from a superclass and this other method, which we haven't written yet, has not. It's one that I've written myself. So it's not required, but it's sort of a, a nicety of, of, the, uh, of the syntax. So, R is actually, so that was the other question, is what is R? And R is actually provided to us um, by Android that, uh, that involves all of our resources. And so um, this actually corresponds with the, um, the, an automatically generated file that's here in Gen. Oops, and you can see some of the old data that was here from last year's class where we don't need this anymore. Yes, I want to delete that. And uh, we can see here that r.java is created automatically. And we're going to take a closer look at this in just a little while. But basically, this just assigns uh, integer IDs. It assigns IDs to a variety of, uh, of properties that allow us to refer to things, uh, and I use things very generically, you as, uh, as with names rather than with, sort of I, uh, with uh, numeric IDs. And so this is automatically generated. By, um, by Eclipse, and, or rather by, um, by Android. And so we, do not, we would not d mess with this too much, but we'll talk more about how each of these come up and how we can modify them uh, when we start looking in more detail at some of the code, um, uh, at some of the code in some of the examples here. OK, so go, coming back to this, what we are doing is we have to uh, override the onCreate method. And then the first thing we do is we call the superclasses onCreate method. And then in order for us to actually display something on this, on this activity, we have to create something called a view. 
And a view is basically just a, an object that contains, perhaps nested within it, other view objects that define the layout of the activity, or the, basically the layout of all of the objects, of all of the widgets that you might see. So a, a view might include something as simple as, a, uh, as just a little text field, for example, for us to see the, the text, hello world. It might be something like a text box for us to actually input some text. It might be something like a checkbox or a button or a table or any number of things that allow us to create some layout on the activity itself. We have to use a view for this. And so we are setting the content view, which is a method that is associated with this, with this activity. And we are telling that we want to set the, the, the view or we want to set the content view of this activity to this layout here, r.layout. Dot main. And so we'd, we'd, I'd sort of done some hand waving before and a moment ago to what R is, but we can see that we're obviously referencing some sort of ID. There's something that, that exists that tells Android what this actually is. And so there was that R file that was automatically generated, but if we take a look at the hierarchy of, of each of these files, one of the things, one of the folders that exists within our project directory is this resource or RES folder that contains a variety of things. And one of them is a layout folder. And in this layout folder, does this actually contain an XML file that has some layout information associated with it? You'll notice that there is, it is called, in fact, main. And this corresponds very well with this, this sort of identifier that we had seen up here, r.layout.main uh, is matched exactly with this main .xml file. So this is the most basic of applications. It, it, it instantiates an activity, or, or that's done actually by the Android OS, but what we've done is we've extended the activity and we've created, um, we've, we've created one and we've set the content view and that's basically it. That's all that this program does. But this, there's an important distinction that we should pay attention to when we are taking a look at this layout. This layout has been predefined inside of an XML file. So we've defined this using an XML file. We predefined it here. But it's also possible to define a layout programmatically as well. And in fact, that brings us to the very first source code that we have here. So what, this, what we actually want to do now is rather than deal with this sort of R stuff, all of this stuff that perhaps was not very intuitive, what we want to start to do is just create an activity that does not require any resources. That all it does is it just uses, it just creates an activity and then it creates a view and then it puts that view in the activity and then that's what we see. And that's what's going on here. So we have, again, the same thing. And this is uh, Activity 01. And all the source code, of course, will be available after the, uh, after the class is over. But we, we create an activity uh, called, or rather, a class called Code 1 that extends activity. And in our onCreate, we, of course, do super.onCreate. Then we have to create a view that we want to, to use. And one type of view that's useful in this case is text view. So there is a data type somewhere that is an extension of this view object that's, that uh, Android has called, or the, the developers have called text view. So I'm creating a variable called TV and giving it a type, text view. And from there, I am instantiating a new object, a new text view object, and passing into it um, this, um, this object or this activity. Did I see a question up here? Are you ever creating a class that does not extend activity? Yes, if you want to create uh, an application that does some other things as well, like a service or a broadcast receiver, then you would create a separate class altogether that would then extend each of those classes respectively. Um, but if you ever want to, um, if you ever want to interact with the user or provide a user interface to, to somebody, then you have to extend the activity. This is the one way, this is sort of the one way right now um, that we can um, create a layout and create views and put them on the screen so that a user will be able to interact with the program directly. But there are other services or there are other things that we can uh, create in our uh, program as well, like services and broadcast receivers that would not extend the activity. Yes? Yeah, you can create um, other classes that will do things. Generally, um, 
Right, no, you would not, no, if you were creating a complex game like chess or something like that, you would not put all of your code presumably in one class and you would factor it out. But a lot of these, um, uh, in, I mean, in most of the examples that we are going to see, we will be putting a lot of the code in one class. Though generally, whenever we create another activity, then that also necessitates that we have a separate class altogether. So if we want... But if we did that, wrote chess, the other classes would not extend activity, right? Right, the other classes do not have to extend activity, only if you wanted to actually create an activity, if you want Android to treat it as, as an activity. But if you do create an activity, or if you do create a service, or one of these other things that are supported by Android, you do have to mention in the Android manifest that that class exists, otherwise it's just going to completely ignore it. Okay, so we have then something that is here that is then creating a text view. And so if you want to see um, all of the various types of views that are available, of course, I certainly recommend looking again at the, um, the Android documentation because there, are, there is actually a pretty good reference that defines a lot of this stuff. So we can see that in reference there is an android.view and within it we can see that there are quite a, uh, quite a few types of things that are available here. Uh, let's see, and where are the um, subclasses? So we might have... Um, we want to find a text view widget, and we can find that here. It's, oh yeah, it's a widget rather than a view. And so they call uh, sort of the end result of all of these views widgets, and so this text view that we have is a widget, and you can actually see all of the methods and all of the things that are available to us here in the reference. And so I certainly recommend when you start looking at some of this stuff to look at, at some of the, uh, uh, the references that are available so that you can see what sort of things you can do with each of these. But coming back here, we can see that we have a text view. And one of the methods that's available to us as part of this widget or as part of this text view is a method called set text. So what I want to do is set the text to oh hi, and then that itself is a view. So I want to set the view of my, of my activity to this view that I have created. Even though this is a, a widget, it's actually a child of this view. And so I can set it to, uh, I can set it to this TV variable that I have here. And so this then is essentially the exact same thing that we saw before, except that we are programmatically creating views rather than predefining them in XML files. Now you'll notice this last thing that's here. This is one of the things that I alluded to earlier, where if you want to actually create an application and you want to log, uh, log it to the console, you can use this log.i. Uh, so there's a log object and there's this i method that allows you to send some information to the console. And it accepts two parameters. One is basically like a name or a tag that you would associate with it. Right now I've given it the same name as the project, but it can be something a little bit more meaningful perhaps, or it could be something uh, that you might find a little bit more organizationally useful. And then you actually can provide some text. And so since this is just a string, all you have to do is you could perhaps concatenate in some variables, like if you were trying to, um, to uh, uh, debug a, a runaway uh, for loop or something like that, you have a variable i, then you can concatenate that in as well. And so what this actually looks like when I run this application is very similar to what we saw before. It's going to install this APK file on my phone that is on the document camera over here. And what we see is exactly that text, very basic, uh, come on focus. It says at the very top, CS76 lecture activity 01, and then underneath it, that text view that we had said, oh hi. So there is this title that we've given it, and this is actually the, the name of the application that, uh, that's at the very top as well, CS76 lecture activity 01, and it happens to give it a title to this activity, and then the activity in the view is what we see in this black screen right there. This is the most basic of applications. But now we've broken down this code, and we know what is going on, and we know why this is happening. But one of the things that I want to point out is the, uh, oops, I don't know if I was connected, uh, no. So if you actually want to um, be able to um, uh, take a look at the, your console log, one of the things you can use is log cat. So you can switch, for example, to the debug, um, to the debug perspective and take a look here at the log that exists. And I don't know if it's exists, nope, it's not, it's not showing up there, probably because it wasn't live at the time. But the other thing that you can do is you can actually run ADB and run the logcat version and see the latest logs that are, that are being present or that are being given by the phone itself. So the, there's a whole lot of junk uh, 
going on here. And you can see a couple of interesting things. One is first the level. We did log.i, which is basically an informational level. There's also verbose, which is v, and there's a debug, which is d. There's a whole bunch of levels that are available. Right now, i is just sort of a basic uh, version that, or a basic log level that we want to be able to use. But then immediately following that is that tag that we had defined. And, and all of these are tags that are being defined by other applications. And then following a colon is the actual um, is the actual text itself that we have specified. And so you can actually use log cat to, um, to pare down this information that you want to see. And so I can run adb log cat. And if I want to see only all of the information provided by this tag activity01, I can provide a filter that looks like this, activity01 colon i. So what I want to see then are all information messages that have this tag activity 01. And what I also want to do is suppress all other messages. And so I will suppress using star colon s, I want to suppress all other tags that, uh, that exist in logcat. So what happens when I hit enter, as you can see, okay, so here you can see actually the first time I did it, I tested it, and you can see that that's, that exists in the log, testing log output two, and then here you can actually see this is the most recent log that we had done. And so if I were to run this application again, which I will do on the phone, and hopefully this will happen live. So now the application has run, and is it going to show? No, maybe I have to run it from, um, from the uh, from Eclipse, so I will try rerunning this application. Oops, okay, it's complaining at me because I it is already currently running. So I will try this once again. It's not started because the current activity is being kept for. Oh, darn it! Okay, well this is another failed live demo. But basically, what happens is. Um, when you run your application, it can be shown live the logs, uh, the, the information that you're posting to the log using ADB Logcats. And you can actually do the same sort of thing in, um, in Eclipse as well. But frankly, I find, this, um, I find this little window to be a little too little. And uh, it's a little difficult to find what exactly you're looking for, even though you can set a filter here and you can also define the log level that you want to see. I find it nice to use a nice big terminal window with ADB to be able to look at the logs that are produced by the application. Any questions on any of this before we move on? Okay, so when we are looking at some of this code, you'll notice that code1.java is basically this programmatic way of, of creating a layout. Code 2 is essentially what we've already seen. It is that, uh, that default that's been created by Eclipse when we want to create a, a sort of a default project. And so what that means is that we are setting a content view using a resource. So we're using r.layout.main. So there exists in our resources directory a folder called layout and it has within it an XML file called main and that is over here. So under resource, layout, main, we can see exactly what is going on. We can see the, the layout itself directly in this preview window, and we can also see in the XML file the layout that it, is, that it is using here. And this is just an XML file, and notice a couple of interesting things. Rather than just using a text view, what this uses by default is sort of this parent child. And there's, this is very important to realize when you're working with layouts in Android, it's sort of like, you can think of it almost like, and, and uh, I know this is a really weak analogy, but think of it almost like HTML in that it uses uh, this sort of parent-child analogy so that you have parents that then own these, these child objects. So right now there's a linear layout, and layouts are views that define the way that uh, other views or subviews can actually be defined within them. And a linear layout, and right now you'll see this is a orientation vertical, which means that it is just going to place every view that's contained within it, all, ch all children views are going to be placed in a vertical layout. So right now we just have one, so it doesn't matter all that much. But if I were to place another text view, it would place it underneath it. And then another text view would be placed underneath that, so on and so forth. And you can actually see that there are a number of properties that we can uh, uh, apply to each of these views, the layout itself, and also the text view that describe a couple of things. Now one thing that's really interesting is this Android colon text property 
of the text view. Notice that it says at string slash hello. This is not actually the string that it's displaying, right? The text that's shown in the text view is actually hello activity 02. So just like we have this concept of having integer IDs that represent each of these, uh, uh, each of these files, we can also have um, values or strings that can be represented just by their name. So notice that we have a string file that also is an XML file, but we have defined a couple of names. So one of them is this hello string, and that hello string has the text that we saw there, hello from activity 02. So uh, Android actually knows that this strings file contains a list of strings that we want to use and it realizes what their names are. Okay, this one is named hello, so I am going to, whenever I request from the layout or, or whenever I request a string that looks like this, at string slash hello, Android knows to look in that strings file and replace this string with the string with that name that exists there. And so this, sort is, it hints at the power of all of the stuff that's available to us within Android. Now next week, uh, when we come back, we'll look more at layouts, we'll look more at text views, we'll look more at all of these resources, we'll start working with intent, uh, but get ready, we're going to dive in very quickly to all of this Android stuff. So until then, see you next week. <laughs> Was it really that much better than last week that you guys had to clap? <laughs> Or is it just that I kept my voice this week for the whole time? <laughs> anyway, thank you. <laughs>